Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop. And these are not hand saws, but today we're gonna be looking at a whole bunch of different saws and what their uses are and what the different types are. Let's dive in. Now, before we really get into this, I have to put a big asterisk on this whole video. And that is, once you start talking about names, you start getting into a little bit of semantics. And different traditions and different places have different names for different tools. And so, what one tradition might call this a carcass saw, another might call this the sash saw, another might call it a dovetail saw. There are so many different names that all of these tools will have. And it's a great way to start arguments, if you really want to, about picking the name for a tool. But in general, if you use a saw to cut a tenon, it's a tenon saw. But in historical terms, there is kind of a classification of tenon saw. But if I use my dovetail saw to cut tenons, it is a tenon saw, right? Well, let's actually look at some of the differences. Now, in general, there are three broad classifications for saws. You have your panel saw. This doesn't have a back. It's usually a little bit longer, but the length really isn't important. It's just that it doesn't have a back. It's just a plate, a panel of steel with a handle on the back. That could be a Ryobi. This is technically a panel saw, though I know a lot of Japanese purists just went, ah! No, well, yeah, technically in the classification, this is a panel saw. Second, you have back saws. These are a panel with a back. The back is what keeps it stiff and strong. And so a back saw is a saw with a back on it. That can also include the Zuki. Anything with a back to stiffen it is a back saw. And then last, you have frame saws. That can be an actual frame saw, something big like this. That can be a coping saw, or a turning saw, or a fret saw, anything where the stiffness is provided by a frame. It's usually a much smaller blade, thinner blade, and far more detailed in comparison to some of these. But all the stiffness isn't provided by the thickness of the steel, or by a back that's on it, it's by the frame around that's holding it in tension. So we're going to start with back saws and work through these. And this is where most of the confusion and name calling and other problems are. The dovetail saw. This is like the quintessential hand tool saw. It is beauty. It is gorgeous. And this is the thing that people usually think is the first saw they should get. And generally, I'm going to tell you, this is the last saw you should buy. Unless you're just going to be doing a ton of dovetails, um, this really is not that useful of a saw. But man, is it the most sexy one in the shop. The dovetail saw basically has three characteristics. Number one, it is a short plate. There is a short distance from the teeth to the back saw. Number two, it's a very thin plate. This is a really, really thin piece of steel. And number three, it has very light set. The teeth do not stick out very far from this. It gives you a very clean cut. It's usually the smallest and the most detailed, but they do come in different sizes. Uh, Pax and a lot of the English traditions have this shorter, stubbier saw, uh, whereas a lot of the American traditions tend to make them a little longer. You can get some from Bad Axe that are called the stiletto that is really long. Uh, they, they come in all different shapes and sizes, but generally they are the shortest of the saws. One step up from the dovetail saw is the carcass saw. This is the most used saw in the shop in my book. Uh, it is the one you're going to get for all of your finished joinery. It cuts it to length, it cuts the shoulders. This is the saw that is what I'm going to say is the first one you should buy. This is the most useful and versatile hand tool saw in the shop. But just like the dovetail saw, they come in different shapes and sizes. With the English tradition, they tend to be a little bit shorter in length, maybe a little bit taller. That means you don't get quite as much throw on the saw back and forth, uh, but you do get a little bit more control because it's all closer to your hand. Next step up from the carcass saw is the sash saw. This is kind of the oddball out, and it's not one that I use very often. It has cross-cut teeth, so just like the carcass saw has cross-cut teeth, the sash saw normally has cross-cut teeth, but I have found some that are rip-cut. The name comes from a bunch of different places, but generally it is a little bit longer and a little bit taller than your carcass saw, just a little bit larger. It gives you that much more versatility. If you ever watch Santa and Rogers from the hand tool school, this is his most used saw. Because it's bigger, it does have a little bit more versatility to it than the cross cut. So he likes to use this more than anything else. I find it just to be a little bit overkill for most practices, so I don't use it that much. Uh, but again, there's a hundred different ways to do it and everyone's gonna find their favorite way. So a sash saw is a great saw to have. Moving on down the line, we have these big monsters. These are tenon saws. They tend to have a very, very tall plate. There's a lot of distance from here. This is for cutting the end of your tenon. So you can actually cut all the way down for larger tenons. 
And this one I have is an even taller plate. I kind of like this one. They tend to be a little bit longer. They are a little bit more beefy because they are longer. They need a stronger back. Uh, these are probably the second most used saw in my shop. I'll cut the shoulders with a carcass saw, and then I'll come in and I'll cut the cheeks with my tenon saw. And so the combination of these two would allow you to do almost any joinery you have in the shop. Then we have to go to the Mac Daddy of them all. When you talk about back saws, you've got these monsters. This is designed to go into a miter box. The miter box holds onto the back and allows it to slide in and out, keeping it in place. It is a very, very long saw, so you have a lot of throw in the miter box. Uh, these, you end up with a few teeth on the tip and a few teeth on the heel that never get used. Uh, so if they aren't sharpened properly, you'll often see a curve in them. But these are monsters. They are huge, huge saws. Um, and they're very, very heavy because they're intended to be held by a miter box. But these aren't the type of saw you want to do without a miter box because they are so big, heavy, and cumbersome. They are a pain to use. But in a miter box, they're great. And then we got two other oddballs way out here on the end. We have the Japanese Dizuki. Uh, this is a very detailed joinery. Generally, this would be your dovetail saw, um, often cross-cut teeth, and it is for the very, very clean cut. Almost no set at all, often no set at all. And this will allow you to get a really, really clean, smooth, detailed cut, an incredibly thin plate, and it's so thin that it has to have a back on here to support it. Then the last one, the gent saw. This is one of my least favorite saws. Uh, you can often find these called dovetail saws. It is a gent saw because it's got this handle on there rather than a normal pistol style handle. Um, I just find them very uncomfortable to use, but a lot of people really like them. And you'll see these a lot in the English tradition for doing dovetails. Uh, this generally requires a slightly shorter bench because of the angle of your hand. Uh, but, you know, they're relatively affordable and you can pick one of these up for, you know, 15, 20 bucks and do dovetails with this. There are other types of back saws out here, but this is the majority of them. These are the 99.9% .9 that you're going to come across. They do come in all sorts of different types. You can get some with the brass back, which these tend to be very, very heavy. They put a lot of weight onto the cut for you, so they tend to be very aggressive, but they're a little harder to start. You have to control them because there's a lot of weight on there. In a lot of the American ones, you get steel backs. Steel backs are far stronger. Uh, they are actually, I would say, the technically better back. However, um, they don't look as good. The brass just looks awesome. Now you're getting a lot of polymer backs. Uh, Veritas is doing that. And actually, I kind of like them. They're, they're pretty darn decent. There's a lot of other technical technicalities. There are a lot of other technicalities to go into it. Do you get a folded back? Do you get a slit back? Do you get a riveted back? Uh, there's lots of ins and outs. And I could go in for days and days on all the little details on back saws. But to get you going, smaller saws usually have smaller teeth. More detailed, they'll give you a cleaner cut, but they cut slower. Bigger saws have bigger teeth, they cut faster, but they're not gonna give you quite as clean a cut. And pretty much all saws are gonna fit into that category. And that's why the carcass saw really is the most used saw in my shop because it's right in the middle. It can do just about everything. And with a cross cut tooth, you can get a really clean cut even if you're ripping. So yeah, that's what I like. Next up, we have panel saws and generally, this is called a panel saw. It is in the classification of panel saws, but this is also a panel saw. It is a saw that is 24 inches or shorter without a back. Now you do occasionally come across the half back. It's usually a little bit shorter of a saw and the back comes out to somewhere around here. And that's kind of like the, uh, the back saw and the panel saw had a baby and they have one with a little back on there. They're kind of useful in general use, but there's one of those things where if it's used for everything, it's used for nothing. A panel saw though is 24 inches or less. If you have a panel saw that is longer than 24 inches, that is a hand saw. This is the only saw here that can be called a hand saw because it is longer than 24 inches. It does not have a back. Often and most common, it has a rip cut. This is a very fast breakdown tool that allows you to cut boards to the right width. Uh, it's probably the second most used tool in my shop, although it's close with the tenon saw. Carcass is number one, the tenon saw or hand saw are number two. And then if you want to, you can get down to a Ryoba. And this usually has two different styles of teeth. It'll have a cross cut on one side and a rip cut on the other. And so if you're ripping down the board, you use one tooth. If you're cutting across the board, then you turn and you use the other tooth. Very efficient, very easy, um, often with very little set or in some cases, no set at all. 
uh, but they are a very functional tool. I don't do a lot with Japanese woodworking, so if you want more detail on Japanese tools, I'm gonna have to send you to another channel because it's not my forte. I tend to work in Western tools. And if you really wanna see all the pros and cons and benefits of Western versus Japanese, I do have an entire video dedicated to that where I go into the details a lot more because there are some very interesting intricacies. Is one better than the other? No. Is one a better body mechanic than the other? No. They're just two different types of woodworking depending upon how you're positioned in usage. And they are both fantastically great at getting the job done. So it just depends on your personal preferences what you like. And then, we have frame saws. Frame saws have a frame that holds it in tension and they come in two basic big categories. You have your bow saw and then you have your frame saw. See, a frame saw actually has a frame around the saw that holds it in place. Whereas a bow saw uses a string on the backside to tighten it up and pull it into tension. So slight nuance there, but if you call this a frame saw, in some places they'll look at you and go, ah, because it's actually a bow saw. But in technicality, in large categories, it's a frame saw too. So let's start at the beginning. A fret saw, or a coping saw, or a jeweler saw. Uh, these are really, really common for detail curved cuts. They tend to have a small blade, not very detailed, um, and th they come in all different shapes and sizes and teeth. You can even get them in a bow saw style that you can make yourself, and I have a video on making this one. Really nice little coping saw. It's actually become my favorite, which is kind of surprising to me. These come in all different shapes and sizes and types, and you get the new concept with the trusses on there. They're really cool. Um, I don't use them that much. I don't do a lot of little detailed rounded shapes. If I did, I'd probably use them more. Next up, we have the turning saw. This is a coping saw that ate its Wheaties. Uh, usually a much longer blade, uh, often about 12 inches or more. This will allow you to cut thicker stock and actually be able to turn. This is the bandsaw of the hand tool world. It allows you to do very detailed curved shapes, but on a larger scale. I don't use this one that much, but uh, again, if you did a lot of curves and shapes, you probably would. If you're from Europe, you're probably very familiar with one of these. This is a European bow saw. Uh, it is the common for joinery. It's usually a bit larger blade, inch to inch and a half, maybe two inches. This would be the equivalent of the tenon saw, or you can get a slightly smaller one for the equivalent of the carcass saw. When most of England and the Americas went over to back saws, a lot of Europe used bow saws, and so you find a lot of these over there. They are a little harder to control because there is more saw there. There's a lot more to detail. But these are really nice because if you have a deep cut, you can get into a lot with this. You can rotate the saw so that you can do things straight down the board. If I'm making really, really big tenons, Usually this is the saw I'm gonna grab. It is very functional and fun for that. The American cousin to something like that is this. This is a buck saw. This is a saw that is intended to cut logs to length, usually for firewood, so you cut them up into 18 inch billets. This will do it. It's big, it has massive cross cut teeth. This will cut through logs rather rapidly. I actually use this in my shop for large stock breakdown. So if I have large boards I need to cut to rough lengths, this is the one I'm gonna grab. It cross cuts incredibly fast, and it's a lot of fun to use. Though generally this is not a great woodworking saw, um, it is more for the lumbermen and actually cutting logs to length. Cross cutting, big, lots of fun. There isn't a whole lot of that in the workshop. And then last, the granddaddy of them all, <laughs> the Rubo style frame saw. And these also come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Um, often they are a, a good bit longer at four or five feet. Sometimes these beams will be closer together for doing uh, your veneer cutting. Uh, these are great for resawing. Usually they have a rip cut tooth. Whenever you have a lot of stock you need to cut through, this goes really, really useful. They are a bit of a chore to control and they are a, there is a serious learning curve to them but they are a lot of fun. And I've got several videos on making these. They are, um, well, yeah, they're just a very interesting saw. So yeah, when people think about frame saw, they think about this. I didn't really go into a lot of the individual uses on these because that requires a whole nother video and I might be putting that out here soon. Uh, there are a lot of different uses for every saw and in the case there are combinations where you might use this for cutting curves or you might actually use this for carcass work. There's a lot of different applications that each saw can go into and there are a lot of expectations where people think that they need all the saws. You really don't. Three or four of these and you could do your entire year's worth of woodworking 
and not have to worry about it. So I'm probably going to cover that in a future video. Also, there's lots of ins and outs on every one of these saws and the details about them and different types and different hardware sets. and. I, there are so many more things in this, so I'm sure you have quite a few questions. Leave all those questions down below. I'll answer as many as I possibly can. I do read through all of them, and I'll, I'll get to all of those eventually. So um, let me know your thoughts and ideas down below. I will probably be doing a video sometime in the future about their uses. Also, there are lots of other saws out there. They all generally fit into those three major categories but I don't have time to cover them all. You know, there's pit saws and frame pit saws. There are stair saws. There are cross cut saws. There are slip saws. There are, there are lots and lots of other saws out there that are very specialized in what they do. So maybe someday I will add some of those into another video, but for right now, um, we're gonna have to draw it there. So if you have any questions, thoughts, ideas, let me know those down below and I will get to as many of them as I possibly can. Also, I wanna say a huge thank you to everyone who's hit that like, share, and subscribe button. Those really do help this channel get farther out and get more people to see it. So thank you for that. It means a lot. If you want to take it one step farther, there's Patreon. Everyone scrolling over on the side, they are the patrons on Patreon. They are the ones quite literally keeping the lights on, as well as members on the channel who've clicked that join button. We do have special perks for both. Without members and Patreon, this channel would not exist. So thank you. If you'd like to find out more about that, there's links to Patreon in the description down below, or click the little join button and become a member. And I think that'll do it for now. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Oh no, I've been framed! <laughs> yeah, we both saw that one coming. Though they are a little bit harder to control because there is a bigger saw on there. Oop, let's tighten that up a little bit. <laughs>